sometimes I like to revisit the electrical system stuff, just the basic stuff for, you know, some of the people that, uh, well, sometimes we all need to brush up. We need to think about things that we don't think about a lot of the time. I used to be the uh, electrical go-to guy when I was working at the dealership. And uh, one of the things that I so enjoyed doing was taking the orange stickers that the uh, Ford would send and they would uh, have you go to the certain pages in the wiring schematic and update those. And so that you would, and then there was a little TSB book over here that was fairly thick that had the updated wiring schematics. And uh, one of the shop foremen and this guy that was working with him came to a Ford probe. They were having trouble figuring out some air conditioner issues on them or what it was, something in the dash. And they fought and fought and fought and fought with that thing. You couldn't figure out why they couldn't make head or tail of the wiring schematic and how this thing was supposed to work. And, um, you know, because of the way I was getting paid, I would always keep the dust blown out of the computers and keep them updated. And I would always, you know, I hung the fans on the wall and so we didn't have to take them in and out every uh, spring and every uh, winter and all that. So I had put an orange sticker on that and they ignored the orange sticker and they were trying to use a schematic that was no good for that particular car. And so uh, I said, why didn't you look at this? So I went over and I pulled a little TSB and then when I opened it up, the wiring schematic, the updated wiring schematic made it real easy to find their problem. Uh, but anyway, we all kind of need to look into wiring occasionally just to, you know, and, and I like to put it together an exam occasionally just to uh, see how that we'll all do on it. And this one's got 20 questions. I'm going to go through the questions first, and then I'm going to follow up and give you the answer, and we'll talk about why the answer is what it is. So maybe we can get through with this in 30 minutes. Um, this particular question here is, the instrument cluster is an illumination circuit. Is most traditionally what kind of circuit? There, are, These are your four uh, choices right here, and this is a picture of an uh, instrument cluster illumination circuit. As you can see that. Um, all right. Question number two, if the tail lamp fuse blows, the instrument lamps will go dark on some vehicles. I kind of got away from the technician A and B and just put one, two, both, and either, whatever. Uh, the positive side of a non-energized cluster illumination lamp circuit will show a ground if checked with a test light. Well, there's your positive side, see? And, uh, this right here would be the how the uh, instrument dim panel dimming module would you know, make the lights come and go. Alright, so you got one is two, two is true, both are true, both are false. Alright, here's the next one. Vacuum fluorescent displays and liquid crystal displays work the same way. Or all digital speedometers are sensor driven rather than cable driven and all analog needle speedometers are cable driven. Is that true or false? Both are false, both are true, one is true, two is true. To determine everything an electronic component actually does in a vehicle system you're working on, the best place to start is the, you know, and here's a little, this, this is obviously from all data, but all of them have got, you know, all of your different shop manuals have got stuff. Owner's manual, table of contents, description operation page for the system in question, wiring schematic pages, TSB index, call your buddy at the dealer, whatever. Okay, the instrument lamps on this vehicle are fed through a rheostat on the headlight switch. Is that true or is that false? These lamps won't work unless the trip reset button is pushed. There's your trip reset button right there. One is two, true is two, both are true, neither is true. All right, question six. A good way to check this BMW brake light switch right here is to bypass it with a jumper and see if the brake lights illuminate. Two, checking a load carrying switch with an ohm meter is not always a reliable test. One is two, true is two, both are true, neither is true. Think about that for a minute. Question seven, with the key off, if you apply the brakes on this vehicle, what will happen? You notice you got an ISO relay here. Uh, this is the common, this is the coil, this is the coil, and this is your normally open terminal. Here's your stop lamp switch, 12 volts in, so you're putting 12 volts right in here. All right, A, nothing electrical will happen. Oh, I just love it when that thing does that. Give me a massive break here. Nothing electrical will happen, the brake light will flash, the fuse will blow, the relay will energize and illuminate the brake light. Here's the fuse panel, hot and run. Gotta pay attention to what these words say, and there's your little stop lamp, that's its representation of it. Question 8, this meter is set to read what? 20 millivolts DC, 20 ohms, 20 volts AC, or none of the above? I'll let you look at that for just a minute before we move on.
Question number nine. What is the difference between a rheostat and a potentiometer? And here's your pictures of both. That's a potentiometer, that's a rheostat. Both the now both components are used on vehicles. Um, but they may not look just like this, but the actual, you know, the rheostats and potentiometers used on vehicles. The seat belt reminder indicator and chime continue to sound when the vehicle is moving even though the seat belt is buckled. A, the buckle switch might be faulty. B, the switch wire might be shorted to ground. C, both. D, neither. I made this funny little guy with his bowl over his head here. Question 11. What most likely caused this damage on the teeth on the flywheel? A, it's a Ford. B, the starter is bad. C, the starter wasn't properly shimmed. D, the flywheel ring gear was too soft. E, operator error. F, cheater pipe. G, idiot. Question 12. Which of these terminal posts should be connected to the alternator output? A, the top one. B, the bottom one. C, the small one. D, ground. E, none of these. F, is this a trick question? Question number 13. This 36 volt motor fits what? A GM vehicle, a Ford vehicle, a BMW, a heat pump for my house, or a Tesla GR32? Question number 14. Customer has to whack this rebuilt starter to get it to work. What's the problem based on this visual inspection? I'll let you study that picture for a second before we move on. Question 15. Intermittent starter. The key is switched on. The cluster lights up normally. When we switch on the key, the customer lights up normally. The key is turned to start and the cluster lights all suddenly dim. Like that. The key is released and the cluster lights remain dim. What's the most likely cause? Question 16. The customer says that since the transmission was removed and reinstalled on this S10 Blazer, the electric lift gate release doesn't work. What's the most likely cause of this concern? Bad actuator due to water leak from evaporator drain, bad end gate release switch, neutral safety switch connector not fully seated, or short to power. And here's a simplified schematic. I got rid of all of the other stuff and this gave you a really simplified schematic on that. Question 17. The DVOM reading with the engine running this engine's running, DVOM is connected here and here. You can look and see how it's connected. What does that show? Does it show too much negative voltage drop? Charging system working, dead battery, sulfated battery, inoperative charging system, current draw, or nothing useful? Let's rewire it. The DVOM reading of the engine running is, and notice it's reading this, is it too low? Positive polarity? Shows a sulfated battery? Shows an inoperative charging system? Shows too much current draw? Doesn't show anything useful? Or it can be done left-handed? Question 18. This lamp is dimly illuminated. What do these readings tell you? you notice here, the battery's got 12.6 volts. I got 12.6 here, 12.3 here, 12.2 here. 12, 1 here, 1.8 there. What does this mean? What do I need to do? What's the first thing you would do to try to straighten this out if you had a circuit that would read this way? Question 19. What's the name of the damaged component in this photo? What causes this kind of damage? Is it low voltage, a bad flywheel, an overcharging alternator, a bad torque converter, or a bad ignition switch? Now for the answers. Now if I was going a little too fast for you on any of these questions, you can pause your video obviously. Everybody knows how to use YouTube. And you can read the question and think about it before you move on. That's why I didn't spend more time on them than I did. 
all right? It's a parallel circuit. And some people would probably say, okay, this is series parallel because, you know, there's in between there, you got a this accessory delay relay, and then you got a fuse, you know, and all that going here, you know, but technically this is parallel because you got all of these depending on the same ground. The current's got to flu go through every one of them. You lose any one of them, the rest of them still work. Now, granted, these little rascals here are LEDs, but they're still instrument illumination. And uh, I just went ahead and did these. Are, this is actually a window uh, uh, control switch and all this kind of stuff. But it doesn't matter. You're, getting, you're kind of still getting the same idea here. Uh, okay, question two. If the tail lamp fuse blows on the instrument lamps, it will go dark on some vehicle. They do have it wired up like that so that if the tail lights blow, the power that, uh, you know, the, 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 the dash lights will go out whenever the power of the tail lights blow on some vehicle. That's not like that on all of them, but I used to see it a lot um, on some of them. Uh, the positive side of a non-energized cluster illumination on that circle will show a ground if checked with a test light. But if you check right here with a test light when these lights are not energized, you're going to read a ground because that ground is going to be coming. That's provided this instrument panel denning module providing something. But uh, mostly the commonest was on older cars when somebody would be putting a radio in the car. Somebody who didn't really know a whole lot but they knew how to check power and ground. Uh, I would see where they would go and connect the... Uh, instrument panel lights, they would actually go checking for a ground for their radio that they were wired up. They'd hook the test light between the positive terminal and they'd see a ground to the instrument panel lights. They'd go, ah, there's my ground. They'd hook radio ground to that and when you plug the antenna wire into the radio, the ground from the antenna wire would go right through there and it would pop the fuse for the instrument cluster lights. And I don't know how many times I went in there and saw where somebody had just measured that for a ground and assumed it was ground even though the wire would blew the red stripe or whatever. And, um, but, you know, typically the radio will get its ground from the antenna anyway, although you might get cleaner sound if you go ahead and hook your uh, ground wire up. Uh, both of these are true. This will show ground, and if the tail lamp fuse on some vehicles, the instrument lamps will go dark. Vacuum fluorescent displays and liquid crystal displays work the same way. That's false. All digital speedometers are sensor-driven rather than cable-driven, and all analog needle speedometers are cable-driven. I've seen them both ways. I've seen, uh, back in the olden days, I would see digital speedometers on some Lincolns and stuff that would actually have a cable going to them. But uh, a lot of the needle-driven speedometers, just about all of them nowadays, are sensor-driven speedometers. I actually took the little drum out of a Crown Victoria speedometer that was uh, sensor-driven one time, and I got the little wires, and I could hook that thing up to a little the battery out of a, a, a keyless entry fob and it would move that little drum around. I actually made some, I got a good battery and I made little marks on the little drum and I would hook those little wires up and I could actually use that little uh, thing out of that, uh, it was a needle driving drum is what it was. I used that for a battery tester for fob batteries for a long time. <laughs> I think I've still got it in my toolbox. I'll only show you a video of me using it. Um, to determine everything an electronic component of it actually does in a vehicle work on description and operation is where I like to go. Because the description and op operation page, if they've got it in the shop manual material you're using, will actually give you a lot of really good information that you wouldn't intrinsically know. You know, a lot of times we don't know what how th these electronic components are wired up or what it is they're supposed to do, you know. And, uh, you can get your, you, know, you can have the idea that you know enough that you don't need to go to description and operation, but when I was teaching, I used to have to constantly berate my students when we were doing electrical and electronic stuff always go to the description and operation page and you'll find information that a lot of times you can figure out the, what's going on with that component uh, really fast. Uh, now occasionally the description and operation page won't help you a whole lot. And there are sometimes you'll have so much such, such, so much uh, entanglement between these, even on vehicles without a network. Um, I, on one of these videos a while back I told a story about a, a ranger that we had were, were working on the wipers wouldn't work right. I don't remember exactly what the thing was. They just were doing crazy stuff. They would, you know, just wouldn't work right at all or wouldn't work at all or wouldn't park. I can't remember what the deal was. And we fought with that darn thing and we looked at all of the wiring and we looked at all the description operation and everything else. 
And finally, I noticed that somehow or another I managed to disconnect the radio, uh, the connectors going to the radio when I was rooting around up in the dash. And when the radio was disconnected, the wipers would work like they were supposed to. And so I said, that's crazy. How could the radio cause the wipers not to work right? And down in a boneyard, we had a little, some kind of little Ford car that was crashed. It was about the same year model as this one. And I took the crappy radio that we had in this Ranger. Well, first I pulled the radio out of the boneyard car, and I brought it up there, and I plugged it in to the uh, Ranger that we were working on. The wipers worked perfectly once we changed the radio. Why that radio was causing the wipers not to work, right, I have no idea. You know, but whenever you're trying to crank out some labor hours and work out a lot of cars, you don't spend a whole lot of time analyzing stuff. But I always remembered that we took that radio out of that car in the boneyard and put it in that Ranger to fix the wipers after we had fought with the doggone wipers for a pretty good while. And um, that was just the wackiest thing that, you know, whew, seen it. every now and then you'll see one like that. Question five, if the instrument lamps on his, oh, excuse me, the instrument lamps on his vehicle are fed through a rheostat. No, they're not. Uh, they're basically fed through out of this thing right here. This t is the, uh, this is a Chrysler schematic. And they typically have a little chip in there that feeds these lights. Now, you might notice that both sides of them are going there. You got this one here to ground, but the panel lamps feed is what's going to make those panel lamps go up and down. And then you'll have a little input uh, switch, you know, it's not shown here, but you'll basically have a little wheel that you'll roll, and it'll give this thing its marching orders. Now, pushing, pushing this has got nothing to do with it. This is just ground. See, all you want to do is ground that little circuit right there for your trip reset, and this is a ground hookup. All right, that's neither is true there. All right, question six. A good way to check this BMW brake light switch is to bypass it with a jumper, see if the brake light is illuminated. That typically works pretty good. You got a two-wire switch. You got to be careful if it's a switch that's got more than two wires on it because you can cause yourself some issues that way. Um, two, checking a load carrying switch with an ohmmeter is not always a rival test. That's true, too. Um, as a matter of fact, the, uh, the top-end trainers that we have at KC Vision up there uh, that are teaching electrical courses, one of the things that they'll tell you uh, right up front is they will tell you that you need to have enough of, you need to have a load equal to the one that you're testing to check your ground with. Like for example, uh, one of them had a little schematic for a little box with six stop lights in it so that you could take some of the bulbs out and you could change your amount of uh, current that it's pulling and all that. So if you're going to go to a particular component that's not working right, you want to hook up between that component and its ground with a component that's pulling just as much load. I talked a while back on here about a headlight bulb I used to check a fuel pump circuit and it turned out that the test light, the little test light I had with a quarter amp bulb would burn, but the headlight bulb wouldn't and the fuel pump wouldn't run and we had a ground that was dropping voltage, but you could not tell that. The same way with a meter. If you check with a meter, you're going to see voltage even if there's not enough there to pull anything. And so using a digital volt ohm meter to check voltage uh, is a lousy way to uh, to check and see, you know, you want to know there's enough current carrying capability there to pull whatever load it is you're checking. So both of those are true. With the key off, if you apply the brakes on this vehicle, what will happen? All right, key off, that's the operative word there. Nothing electrical will happen because this relay does not have a connection between the normally open and the common until you energize it. Now when you turn on the key, hot and run, would pull these two together and then you'd have stop lights. More and more vehicles, they're not all, they're not all wired like this. If ever, you're running more and more vehicles all the time that the stop lights will not work unless the key's on. And that will really confuse somebody that's not used to working on you know some of the later model cars that won't work. Like, you know, Volkswagen for years, when you switched off the key, the headlights would go off and the park light would stay on. My goodness, they've been like that ever since the 60s and possibly before that. All right, question eight. This meter is set to read what? None of the above. This is reading, this is DC volts. This is AC volts. When you see that little symbol there, that's DC volts. This is 20 volts DC. None of these answers are right. Question nine. What's the difference between a rheostat and potentiometer? A rheostat carries a current load. A potentiometer provides a signal. Think throttle position sensor on this one here. Think your older vehicles that on the headlight switch they had a little ceramic resistor and it has a little and that was your that little rheostat gave you your bright and dimming for your uh, for your headlights. I mean for your dash instrument cluster lights. All right. 
Question 10. The seatbelt reminder indicator and chime continue to sound when the vehicle is moving even though the seatbelt is buckled. Both of those could be right. Alright? See, this is a strange question. <laughs> oh, I got it worded. That's odd. Uh, the buckle switch might be faulty. The switch wire might be shorted to ground. I should have put both the A and B. You know, and then I put neither A and B, but I left those words out. So if that switch, if that wire is grounded, you know, then you might have an issue there. Um, although, to be perfectly honest, most of the uh, this question here was ill written to start with all the way around. Um, typically, if the switch is closed whenever you enter, when you uh, insert the seat belt buckle in there and that makes that go off. So I kind of wrote that question backwards. Uh, I'll give you that one as a freebie because I didn't write the question well. Alright, question 11. The starter wasn't properly shimmed. To begin with, this is not a Ford because the starter bolts up here. See, the bolts go in from the bottom. Remember one of those Terminator movies, Arnold Schwarzenegger's Terminator character was up under this Ford Bronco supposedly changing a starter and he had a ratchet and a long extension going straight up. Just like you would on a Chevrolet. And I was watching that movie with my wife a couple of years ago, or whenever it was. And uh, whenever he was laying on the ground running that socket straight up to take that starter off that Ford, I said, you're not working on a Chevrolet Schwarzenegger. And she told me to shut up. Okay. All right, then. Question 12. Which of these terminal posts should be connected to the alternator output? That one right there. I actually saw uh, one time a car came in and they said that... Uh, they had had a starter put on it and the alternator wouldn't put out afterwards and that was because somebody had connected the alternator output post to this wire right here. A lot of your automakers like to use that main, that big starter post for a junction because it's a good solid connection that's not as like, not likely to get hot. It's a good, you know, it's made to carry a lot of amps anyway. And that works pretty well for that. Question 13. This might be a question that threw you a curve. This is, a, you know, the uh, idle stop vehicles that Chevrolet has. That's what this motor is for. <laughs> it's a 36 volt motor, but it's actually an idle stop vehicle. You know, the, one, the ones that operate like a golf cart where when you stop, the engine dies, and when you hit your foot on the gas, this, is a, this thing starts it back up. So that's a starter generator motor and all that. Interesting how that thing is made, too. You see that little uh, armature back there side of the motor like this? That thing right there does not have any copper. Uh, it basically got aluminum, uh, you know, down in there. There's a lot of uh, uh, instruction that has to go into explaining how one of those motors works. I was in a class one time in Kansas City about that. It's pretty cool. Question 14, a customer has to whack this rebuilt starter to get it to work. You see that little screw right there and how it scorched around there? This screw is the screw that provides the ground to the brush holder and the starter. Now, I don't know how many times I saw this on Power Stroke Diesels uh, back in the late 90s. Whenever somebody would come in, they say, "My start, you know, my, I'm not getting it. I got a no-crank situation. And I would go out there and I'd look up, and I'd roll under that thing on the ground before I even moved the vehicle. And I would look at the back of that starter, and around one of the screws, one of these kind of screws here, this is not a diesel, this is actually in a Dodge. Uh, Sebring or something, a two point, or maybe 2.4, I don't remember, but I do remember it was a, die, a Chrysler vehicle. She had put a starter on it because she had to whack the starter to get it to work. And after she put the starter on it, she still had to whack the starter to get it to work. And boy, if you don't think that will confuse a girl that's, a, you know, in a college situation. Anyway, she wanted to know, wanted us to check that because she thought maybe she didn't need a starter. What we did was, we took that screw out and we brushed this real shiny and put the screw back in, brushed the screw shiny, got it good and tight and she never had any more trouble with it. Those power stroke diesels, I would go out there and I would take one of those, the screws out that were arcing and short and like that because they had worked loose, clean them up and put them back in. Instead of replacing a $750 starter, I would do a little quick job just laying in out there on my back in the lot, you know, on the service lot and fix those vehicles. It doesn't take very many vehicles that you fixed that way. You know, you can even talk to your customer. You say, I don't think you're going to have any more trouble because I went ahead and did this, and you would charge them a minimal charge. You'll get customers for life if they know you're going out of your way to not sell them something they don't need, and if you fix something surgically like that. Now, there's some people, as far as starters goes, uh, on my one of my 
uh, technical writer page, or well, it's actually one of the other pages on Facebook. Um, I did. Uh, I said something about a little starter procedure. I mean, a little super, where you can test your battery to see if it's suitable for the car you're driving. You know, especially if you're driving a car that's eight, ten years old, whatever. Uh, you know, ordinarily you're supposed to go half of your cold cranking amps for 15 seconds and see if the battery voltage drops below 9.6 volts. Okay, so if you hook a meter up to that battery and you spin the starter for 15 seconds and, the bat and it stays above 9.6 volts, that battery is okay for that car. Now, you know, there's some other stuff that people talk about, like your electronics require more than 10 and a half or they'll reset and blah, 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 and all this kind of stuff. But, but I mean, I put that on there just because I knew it would start a discussion. And this one guy is real, was real militant about this. He goes, if you spin a starter more than 10 seconds, you're going to burn that starter up and that customer's going to come back on the hook the next day. And uh, there was a lot of other people that were saying, no, that's a bunch of hard wash. Anybody that's ever worked on cars very much knows that sometimes you have to spin a car for a little while. Heck, a lot of times on those some of those diesels, you have to bleed out the, uh, the Huey oil system on them. You have to uh, take those little plugs out and spin that thing for a minute and a half, two minutes to get it all, you know, uh, all the air burped out of the uh, oil passages in the heads and all that stuff. Uh, but anyway, starters are tougher than that. Now, if the starters are about to fail anyway, you know, it, it's going to need one. You know, so anyway, that was a, you know, little uh, congest I got into talking to this guy about this. He just swore up and down. If you spin a starter more than 10 seconds, you're going to burn it up. You know, that's a bad idea. And everybody else was telling him, other instructors teach this. What is your problem? I don't know what his problem is. Alright. Question 15. Intermittent starter. The key is switched and the cluster lights up normally. Battery terminals they clean it. That's what's going on here. If you switch that thing on and you see these lights go dim like that, that means your battery terminal needs to be clean. Well, that's the first place I'd go. I put it that way. You've got a connection somewhere uh, that is arcing and not you know, providing good solid you know, when you turn it on, that additional, uh, now I don't know if any of you remember this, but on the older, you know, like in your early 70s model Chevys and stuff, there was a crazy situation when you had a bad positive diode in the alternator and you'd switch the key off and pull it out, you'd see the alternator light was still on, which was a really interesting situation. You know? But, um, all right, question 16, customer says this transmission was moved, reinstalled on this S10 Blazer, the electric lift gate release doesn't work. We actually ran into this one time. That was a neutral safety switch connector, not fully seated. It was making contact with all the other terminals, but it wasn't making contact with the one that provided a ground for the end gate release actuator. If you've got it in park or neutral, that's grounded. If you get it in any other gear, it's not. They don't want you accidentally open the hatch while you're driving down the road and you lose your kids and your dog and your ice chest. This is a bad idea. That was a 96 model S10, by the way, uh, S10 Blazer. Uh, the, too much negative voltage drop. You're not supposed to have more than about a tenth of a volt at the most on that side. Now, is that going to cause a massive problem? Probably not, but I would still do some scratching around and cleaning on wherever the alternator mounts to the block and all. You almost never see this, but that's, you know, that's a hypothetical. Uh, this says question 17, which that means I've actually got two question 17s on here, and that's not a good plan. Uh, this shows a sulfated battery. If this thing's been running a while with the alternator putting it out and it goes above uh, 15 volts, you know, uh, then actually that question's not really written right either. Um, and I apologize for that. I kind of threw this together in a hurry yesterday. When you're charging the battery with a battery charger, you've got to get a strong battery charger on it. You check the voltage of the battery while you're charging it. Some, char some chargers have actually got a needle on them for this. You turn that thing on, if after three minutes it goes above 15.6, you've got a sulfated battery. This is not as likely to show up with the engine run. If the engine run, you may have a problem with your regulator. This one here is a bad ground right here. you got more than you need right here. And this one right here, and this is the commutator. And what causes that is low voltage. If you've got low voltage, it's almost like the starter is locked or something. All right, I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you got a little something out of it. Um, it still boggles my mind that that guy that tells me he has 35 years of experience swears up and down that you'll burn a starter up if you spin it for longer than 10 seconds. And uh, other people besides me, I guess he thinks everybody else is dumb as a brick. Uh, but you know, he won't argue about that. That's okay. Um, you know, sometimes I, I posted that because I knew it would probably cause some controversy. Uh, you know, but there's some things that are just not that big of a deal. 
Y'all have a good week. I'll see you next time.